It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Legislative Affairs Committee. We're delighted to have uh, with us uh, two representatives who are both running for Senate. And uh, at this time, I'd like to remind you to shut off your uh, cell phones if you came in late. This is being recorded for cable and will be distributed through YouTube as well. Uh, we just don't want to have any distractions while the, the representative is speaking. Um, also remind you that the uh, restrooms are out on the right, and uh, if you're walking out that way, please stay behind the camera so not to impact the uh, video quality. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our Chair of Government Affairs, uh, Ray Ledoux, Administrator from Brockton Area Transit. Ray. Thank you, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, we will have, I'm sure, a, a lively discussion here uh, and presentation from our state representatives who will be running for Senate. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, UMass, Bos uh, UMass Boston, for sponsoring the Government Affairs Committee and the Brockton Community Access uh, Cable for covering this event as well as many other events of the Chamber over the course of the year. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Representative uh, uh, Shauna O'Connor. Uh, welcome, Representative. Uh, Selectman uh, Robert Brady from Avon, uh, Selectman David Sheedy uh, from East Bridgewater, and of course Mark Lindy, uh, who is an elected official on the school committee of the Southeastern Regional School System. So normally we have an icebreaker question, but in the sense of brevity, because I'm sure that we want to hear uh, clearly what the representatives have to say, as it may impact uh, voters uh, during this very, very important election. I'd like to welcome uh, Representative Brady, and Representative Brady to many people, as well as our next representative, is well known in the region. Uh, uh, representative Brady represents the 9th uh, Plymouth District, which represents many precincts and wards here in the city of Brockton. He's a lifelong resident of the city of Brockton. He's attended Brockton High School as well as Massasoit Community College. Has served uh, on the city council for many terms uh, as an elected official. Um, and has served uh, on several committee, uh, uh, committees while serving as a member of the legislature. Uh, presently, uh, he serves as vice chair for the House Committee on Bonding, uh, Capital Expenditures, and State Assets. Uh, Representative Brady is well known for his bipartisan efforts and for his service to constituents and his interest in gateway cities and economic development. He has worked in both the private sector, in the insurance industry, and in the public sector as well. And uh, welcome, Representative Brady. Thank you, Ray. Thank you for having me. So what we'd like to do is uh, give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about what's happening uh, through uh, your course as being a legislator and how you think uh, that you could best serve the region uh, if you are elected as a senator for, for this area. Thank you. And I want to thank uh, Chris Cooney and the Metro South Chamber of Commerce for having us both here today and uh, everyone who showed up. Uh, I'm fairly known in the district here. I've worked with a lot of in past initiatives, and I look forward to uh, representing you on the state Senate level. Um, we lost a good friend of ours in, in the district, Tommy Kennedy, who was a great friend to all of us, a great advocate on behalf of this district, a great friend of mine and a mentor to myself. Um, he did more work from his hospital bed at times than most people do in a normal day's work. I, I met with him leading up to his passing the week prior to his passing and was working on legislation for Massachusetts Community College. And then I corresponded with him the weekend before his passing and then we got the call um, Sunday night. We're at an Eastern Town Committee meeting and we were awarding a scholarship to a young student from Oliver Ames School and uh, we got the call just after that that he had passed. So uh, thereafter I got several calls from uh, colleagues of mine and, and people in the public sector and the private sector about what's going to happen now, et cetera. I said, well, I don't want to talk about anything out of respect to his family till after the, the wake and the funeral, and, and that's how I would be with anyone. And it happened even when, when Frank Powers, our clerk of court side several years ago, a similar situation, we ended up having a special election. And um, so I didn't discuss anything until after the uh, wake and the funeral, and then when Bill Galvin, our Secretary of State, called for the special election, set the dates for the primary and the um, general election, we uh, talked with a lot of our friends out there. I had a lot of correspondence and calls from friends and supporters out there about myself running for the seat, knowing the worth that I've had over the years. And um, I want to continue doing what I've always done. I've been a worker for the people and the residents of my constituents of the district. I served for over seven and a half years as a state representative currently right now. Prior to that, I served on the city council in Brockton and on the school committee. 
So I feel I know the issues hand in and hand out. And I know the district hand in and hand out. I've had, uh, my family has lived in the district besides being a lifelong resident of the city of Brockton. My sister grew up and uh, raised a family in Whitman. My aunt and uncle belonged to the VFW in Whitman. They're unfortunately passed on now. I had an aunt and uncle in Hanover who raised their family in Hanover. I've had an aunt and uncle in Hanson that raised their family in Hanson. So I've worked in the district as well. I've worked for a news agency that delivered newspapers and magazines to the district when I was paying my own way to Master Community College. And I've also worked in the insurance business. I uh, worked for Metropolitan Life and I started my own insurance business in 1995. So not only have I worked in the public sector, I've worked in the private sector. And I uh, chose to run for public office because I wasn't happy with the way things were going. You know, we grew up in a city that it was a different time back in the olden days when the shoe industry was booming in Brockton and everything seemed to go well, but things change over time. Our shoes are not uh, currently made in too much around this area anymore. And, um, you know, malls get built, so the, the mall got built up at Westgate Mall that took away from our downtown. The high school got built, beautiful new high school in 1970, the biggest high school east of the Mississippi. Had great programs, but of course that took away foot traffic from our downtowns. And things changed. Uh, crime increased, the image of the area decreased, and uh, people told me, Mike, you're always talking about this, talk about that, why don't you run for office? So I ran for school committee in 1995, got elected, worked very diligently to get funding for our schools, and uh, then a special uh, council seat opened up with the uh, moving on of my predecessor, Tom Pluff, who was appointed to a city solicitor's job. We had a special election. I had tremendous support from the community, served on the city council for over 13 years in the city of Brockton, and then when the state house of representatives seat opened up uh, due to the untimely passing of Frank Powers, who was our clerk of courts, our friend Bob Creedon moved on to run for the clerk's job. Tom Kennedy, who served 25 years in the House of Representatives, moved on to run for the Senate seat, and I ran for the uh, House seat. And I had a great uh, candidacy, some great candidates ran for that seat. Uh, fortunately, I topped the ticket, and I've been serving in the State House since. And I've worked very hard to get funding for the area, and I've continued to do what I've always done is work on behalf of my constituents. A lot of the members of the chamber know me, you know, the work I've done. We've worked to help get funding for our schools in Brockton with Chapter 70 money. Our roads, we need a lot of funding for transportation to help the business community to get to and from their businesses as well as people to get to school. And we help get money from the state to fund for Route 123, the quarter, with service transportation bond money. We also got funding for Route 27, which is another car fare coming into the city of Brockton from where Westgate Mall starts and coming into downtown. Uh, we've worked to keep businesses downtown, our, our state agencies downtown. And I've worked with some of the local business community here in Brockton to keep uh, businesses downtown and, and state agencies downtown. But it, again, the city has changed and we've got to work. We've got a whole new population that's now investing in our community and uh, we've got to support them. So Vincenti's Market on Pleasant Street, which is a great new business, we've helped to get them into downtown. This has been a long planning stage. That was a vacant property for many, many years. It was plighted. Uh, a lot of people wanted to know what happened, how come nothing's in there. I'll tell you the quick history. There was a factory there that was a shoe factory. They closed. Then it became a A&P supermarket back in the blizzard of 78. I can remember neighbors and friends bringing their sleds down to the market to get their groceries. And Pleasant Street, which is like a highway, uh, was like a one pathway going to and from the market. They sold out to Star Market, which then got bought up by Shaw's and Shaw's didn't need the property, so it was a vacant property for many, many years. We worked with our local elected officials and our state delegation to help get that moving up and running. There was a lease on the property for many, many years, so anybody who tried to get into the property had to either buy out the lease or sublease, and it wasn't cost effective. Finally, that lease ran out. We were able to get the property up and running. Vincenti's, which is a great family-owned business, done a tremendous job there. They've got the freshest fruits and vegetables, but somebody like me with the cholesterol issues, I they should be shopping there more often. And uh, they, they are a great business and a great investment to our community. And the Neighborhood Health Center, which has been a great asset to downtown, we helped that get up and running. Uh, I can remember at St. Patrick's Church with uh, Mary Virginia Curtis, who started the health center. And uh, some of the opponents in the city thought it would be a plight to the city, thought it would be bad. It's been nothing but a great asset to our downtown community. We've created jobs, we've filled the need for the less fortunate community, our elderly population, and that's bulging and growing at the seams and it's creating more jobs, which is great for our downtown. 
and they were a part of the Vincentes proposal as well. And we worked hard with the George Knight building. That was a shoe factory that went by the wayside. It was vacant for many, many years. We worked with Jason Korob to get that building up and running and occupied, and it's fully occupied, and it's brought great small uh, families into the city of Brockton to help spend money into the city of Brockton. And uh, they commute with the railroad, which is another great asset that Brockton has, which is a lot of communities don't have. I know there's a railroad that goes through Hanson, but there's talk about other expansions of the railroad, but there was a concern with transportation because we still we do a great job with our railroad through Brockton. There's no railroad grade crossings. We have the viaducts that our forefathers put forth, but our transportation system still needs to be fixed. And uh, we've worked with this. We're working with the governor on this. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be done, especially with the winter we just had. And uh, I don't like to read the old Farmer's Almanac too much, but they're predicting another tough winter coming up uh, this coming winter, and we have to be prepared for that. So I just want to continue doing what I've always done is represent the people. I know most of you here. I've worked with you. I, uh, my, my ears are open and my eyes are wide open as far as that's why we have two ears and one mouth to keep my mouth quiet and listen, because that's the most important thing. And uh, I'm here to listen to your concerns and see what we can do to improve the quality of life for our residents. Okay, well, th thank you, Representative Brady. I think I learned one, one or two things. Uh, you're part historian <laughs> and, and, and maybe part weatherman. Yeah. So uh, uh, I think we're going to try to keep track of your forecast I, I did here. take meteorology <laughs> in school, but uh, I didn't want to pursue that career. It's almost like politics, though, with the, you know, the fair weather fans out there, as they say. <laughs> well, well, thank you. We do have a few questions uh, here that have been drafted, and I can see that those who drafted the questions, did not go to parochial school here in Brockton, <laughs> so I'll do the best to read these as, as, as I can. Um, so, so these are uh, uh, questions for you. Uh, what issues uh, will you make a priority as senator uh, for the Brockton area, and I want to add the Metro South region? Sure. One issue that we've already started to address, uh, two issues that go hand in hand, the public safety issue and the opiate addiction crisis. And we worked with that on the, with the past administration, Governor Patrick's administration. We passed some legislation on that. It had bipartisan support. And uh, it, it finally, we started to address the opiate addiction crisis. Uh, in, in the cliche in the olden days, while it was only happening in the cities like Brockton and New Bedford, it's happening all over. We have, we have people with addiction problems in Weston and Dover. In, in West Bridgewater, I know the golf league uh, went to a party one, one uh, day. And, they tried the OxyContin, and some of them later on became addicted to heroin, and they're no longer with us. We've lost too many young people to this situation. So we've started to address this in the last term. Moving forward, I know that uh, Governor Baker's administration has been right on top of this, and this is one issue where we work bipartisan to collectively. And I've been at hearings all across the Commonwealth, a lot in Plymouth County. I know our mayor has been on a task force regarding this. And uh, I think it's great that the governor has been on top of this as well. We recently passed a supplement to budget to address this because some of these rehabilitation facilities are still overcrowded. So we passed some funding to get some help and to expand the facility space and beds that are needed and uh, also to get more help for these young people. Tied in with public safety, a lot of the illegal drugs that go, happen in our community affects violence and other things that have happened in the city break-ins to people's homes or even people's uh, existing homes. I know a family in Easton that the, the poor son had an addiction issue. He was stealing everything from his parents' household, the TV and everything else, and selling it out on the street. And uh, now he came at a church meeting in Easton recently, spoke about the issue. He's now been clean for a year and a half, but he can't even live in his hometown because he knows where the uh, proposals are and the pressure to, to purchase these illegal drugs. But a lot of the violence that is happening is happening hand in hand with us. I also served as Vice Chairman of Public Safety and Homeland Security. And we've always worked hard to get the Shannon Grant put back, which is funding from the state to help with gang prevention and preventive medicine to help curb. And, and I'm a big advocate for trying to solve the problem before it happens. And I, I think the Shannon Grant has been a, a great asset to not only the city of Brockton, but the whole Commonwealth of Massachusetts to help prevent with gang prevention. Right. Well, thank you for that, for that answer. We know that there are strong feelings on both sides of the issue of charter schools. Uh, we know that there are issues with, um, you know, uh, business and educators on this and strong feelings locally. 
and feelings on behalf of the Commonwealth and the administration. What is your position on charter schools and what are your thoughts on the matter? And will you support them or, or oppose them? Well, my biggest concern with charter schools is taking the funding away from <coughs> uh, our school's budget. Brockton has a tremendous uh, amount of funding they get from the state. If not for the funding, we wouldn't survive. We're one of the top schools in the district and, and we try to provide funding for a lot of the other communities as well. If a charter school came into Brockton alone by itself, it would be a $10 million revenue hit to the city of Brockton, which would be devastating to the citizens and the students of Brockton. We have many choices we have for children in the community. We have children who go to Southeastern Regional School. We had a champion charter school that, that was in Brockton. It was going to fail. It got absorbed by the Brockton school system. We also <coughs> have the Catholic Academy that's working. We have school choice where some of these students can go to either Avon or West Bridgewater Public Schools. And we have to offer, to offer many choices to students. But the concern I have and the biggest concern is the funding mechanisms. Um, you know, the Horace Mann Charter School seems to work. But again, the biggest concern I have is taking away funding from our budget because Brockton would not survive without the funding we get locally and from the state, and this would be devastating to our budget. Okay. If you, if you are elected senator, how will you provide leadership uh, to bring the region's le legislative delegation together to address business issues and business matters within the Metro South region? Well, I think I will continue to do what I've always done. I've worked well in the State House. We've brought, uh, you know, the Speaker of the House has been down to Brockton listening to the business community's issues. We had them in businesses here. I've got a great relationship with the Senate President, and I work with the current Governor. We're working on a few different issues, as I mentioned. Uh, I think uh, my work relationship and working across party lines is, is going to help the business community, and I think you've got to listen. Now, does it mean everything's perfect? Of course not. Uh, we have a lot of issues that business are concerned of with health care, taxes, um, and other issues. It, we've got to work together. Now, sometimes it doesn't please everybody, but I think my relationship working with the current business community and my relationship with other businesses across the district has helped. I've built up relationships with these businesses, and I think the relationship I have at the state level, being able to get things done that we've currently had done moving forward, I think it's just a natural transition for myself. Uh, moving from the House to the Senate. Now, as, as a senator, um, I think people look towards the Senate and leaders and uh, members of the House of Representatives uh, for guidance and energy around bringing investment uh, to the city and the region. Uh, what will you do to bring investment uh, and business opportunities to the region? Well, we've worked on tax incentive financing programs <coughs> to help businesses come into the area. We work with our local elected <coughs> officials. Now, sometimes uh, state officials don't always get along with the local officials. I know there's an issue in the town of Easton with a developer right in the center of town that I think I just talked to some constituents over there recently. I believe the issue has finally been resolved, but here's a, a, a great businessman looking to invest in the center of town. There's a great little restaurant there that's a gold mine. Uh, it's been a tremendous asset to the downtown, but there was concerns with parking and everything else. And I think that my relationship with my local officials and with some of the town officials working together, I think that's how you get things done. You have to l work with the local officials, and we've been able to do that. I know Mr. Malley here is our parking authority director. He's worked to develop proper parking in our downtown and has done a tremendous job doing that. So you've got to help with better access to help the businesses get to and from in our transportation situation as well. As I mentioned, we were able to get funding for Route 123 and 27 into the community here. We're working on expanding that across other parts of the district, and you have to ha work together, and uh, that's how you get things done. And I think my relationships I've built up over the years, as not only as a state uh, representative, but prior to that as a city councilor, has helped solidify those uh, relationships. I think a good follow-up question that was just handed in is, uh, uh, related to that issue. What do you think the biggest challenges and opportunities to development uh, uh, are, are, are uh, facing the region here in, in, in the city of Brockton? Well, some of the zoning regulations. I know that, you know, prior to being in the state delegation as a city council, we have helped pass some zoning um, ordinances that helped with small businesses to come into the area. But uh, working further on, I know our city council has continued to do that. Council Bob Sullivan passed an ordinance to help make it easier for businesses to locate in our city. And uh, I think you've got to help work on the same 
with the other elected officials in the other towns. There's some things we do at the state level and there's some things we do at the local city or town levels. And uh, I think sitting down at the table working together with these elected officials helps get things done. And, and as I mentioned, we, we do what we do at the state level and th some things are left to the local level. I think we have time for maybe two or three more questions here. Sure. And one is on affordable housing. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that if uh, you happen to live or work in Brockton, there seems to be quite a concentration of affordable housing. Uh, but throughout the region and the city of Brockton, what's your position on affordable housing? Well, Brockton has met the criteria there at the, the cap of affordable housing. I know some other communities around here are debating about affordable housing. We've been able to do things to do mixed-use housing, so it's not all affordable housing in one concentration. We've had um, market rate development mixing with affordable units in some of these downtown buildings that have helped get these vacant buildings up and running back on the tax rolls, so you got tax revenue come into the community, and it's worked, and I think we can do that in other communities. But again, you have to work with the local officials. In, in some uh, areas, they, they're totally against affordable housing, and they fought against it. I know there's laws in place that you have to accept so much, and uh, that's where it comes down to meeting with the local officials and the residents to make sure they're happy with everything. Now, in the past uh, administration, or the uh, Patrick administration, there were many years of work that uh, took place here by the legislative delegation to hopefully bring a downtown education collaborative here. It was announced in the final days of the Patrick <coughs> administration, a lot of fanfare. Uh, I know that you were up, you were, you were there. What is your position on what can be done and what will you do to work with Governor Baker to try to bring the downtown uh, college collaborative that is a, a partnership between Massasoit Community College, Bridgewater State University, and UMass? What will you do and what kind of message would you convey to Governor Baker and his administration? Well, this is a huge issue that we've been working on for many, many years prior to me even getting it to the state house as a city <coughs> councilor. As I mentioned earlier, you know, a high school got built in 1970, but it, it took away that foot traffic downtown. Uh, the malls get built, that took away foot traffic downtown. That was a major negative impact on our downtown. So we worked with the prior administration, the Patrick administration, to finally get approved to not only the downtown, but also we have uh, the president of Massachusetts Community College, Sally Wall, here for our Allied Health Center at Massasoit campus as well. So both are, are very much needed. There's a waiting list to get into Massachusetts for the nursing program alone of students with perfect grade point averages. Allied Health is where the jobs are. And getting back to downtown, we finally, um, the state purchased the building, the Ganley building downtown, right in the heart of downtown. Everything got approved under the prior administration. Everything was a go. But again, the reality is until the shovel's in the ground, it doesn't mean anything. So the current administration, this is one thing that, you know, I work with, uh, together with, with some issues on, and, and believing on, with Governor Baker on some of the issues he's in favor of, but this is one thing I'm concerned about. He put on hold the funding for the downtown college collaboration. And I understand any expenditures, you've got to look where the money's going to go because you don't want wasteful spending. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we've been working on this thing for many, many years. And it finally got approved. It wasn't a, something like a pie in the sky that we just pulled off our hat. So we finally got it approved. Now it's been on hold. And this isn't just Brockton. There's other communities that have been put on hold and other community colleges and other districts that have been put on hold. Community colleges are, are, are a threshold to get young families their foot in the door to get ahead for proper training, to get training for, to be back in the workforce. So that all being said, it's been put on hold. We met with Jay Ash, uh, with, with our fellow delegates, um, uh, State Representative Claire Cronin and Michelle Dubois. We met with the mayor's office on this. We're continuing to move forward to work together on this. But in the meantime, because of the delays happening, uh, I just found out recently the city council has filed an, an order um, to maybe have the city get the property back from the, the state. And, and, the, and the, the city sold the property to the state for a dollar. There's a much greater value to that property. And, and now they're looking to take the property back because there's a vacant building sitting there and it's, it's a supply to our downtown. So I think it's so crucial we get this thing moving. I'm going to continue to work with the governor in, in his administration. And uh, it's too bad because when we lost Tommy Kennedy, he had a great relationship with J.S. J.S. is, you know, he used to be working on the Secretary of Finance back in, in a former administration. He knows cities. He's from Chelsea. He knows Brockton. So we're hoping to continue this dialogue. But in the meantime, I believe the city council couldn't wait, so they filed an order to maybe have that property taken back by the city. So 
I think we still have to keep this discussion open. Okay, that being the final question that we asked, why don't we let you, uh, you know, kind of wrap up and give us your final thoughts uh, before we have uh, Representative uh, Deal come in shortly. Sure. So, um, go ahead. Thank you, and thank you, Ray, and thank you for everyone coming today. I know <coughs> everyone's schedule is busy. Uh, I'm going to, as I mentioned when I started this conversation, continue to do what I've always done is work on behalf of the district. I'm a lifelong resident of the district. I know the district hand in and hand out. Uh, I listen to issues not just about Brockton but out in the district, you know, the Silver Lake situation in Montpontet. I've gone to water meetings down there. There is a big issue that we've got to bring the two sides together because what happens in Brockton doesn't necessarily agree with what's going on in Halifax and Plimpton and I think we've got to bring the, the sides together and that's where I've been helpful. I've been able to work together with both Republicans and Democrats, with business leaders in the public sector and the private sector, bringing all parties together to get things done and I'm going to continue to do that. Most of you here know me, you know my work ethic. Um, I kid with people that, you know, if I was ever married and had a family, that would be my priority. But in, this, in serving in government, uh, I'm never home because I'm always helping people out. So I'd be divorced already if I was ever married. And people joke about that. But that's part of my work ethic. Work ethic. My, uh, my whole work ethic is 24-7. I've been here for the residents and, and the people, and I'm going to continue to do that. And even, even in, the, in the Senate, I've got a relationship built up with both Democrats and Republicans. So I think it's a natural transition as I've worked on the House side. I'm going to continue to do that in the Senate side. Well, on behalf of the Chamber, our Government Affairs Committee and the entire Chamber would really like to thank you for your years of public service. And no matter what happens in November, we want to wish you the very best. Thank you very so much. Thank you. Thank you. A reminder, uh, this is the regularly scheduled Government Affairs Committee uh, of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Phil Carver has arrived. He's our sponsor for the series uh, from UMass Boston, so let's have a round of applause. <laughs> I would ask you, Phil, and, and anyone else who came in a little later, is to, to shut off your phones uh, and your pagers or anything else you have. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ray? Well, welcome again, and I'd like to uh, again thank uh, UMass Boston uh, for being our sponsor for the Government uh, Affairs Series that we have throughout the year, and again, uh, Brockton Community Access uh, Cable. And uh, we're, uh, we're welcoming Representative Jeff Deal, uh, the second representative today who uh, we're speaking with uh, who is running for the Office of Senate of this district. So Representative uh, Deal uh, presently serves in the 7th Plymouth County District, which represents Abington, East Bridgewater, and Whitman. Uh, the representative was born in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and moved to Whitman uh, to return uh, with his wife, Kathy, to her hometown. Uh, he's a graduate of Lehigh University, has previously worked in the advertising industry prior to being elected uh, to the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Uh, he also served on the Whitman Finance Committee. He has served on several committees uh, while serving as a member of the legislature, and he presently serves on the Joint Committee on Housing, the House Committee on Global Warming and Climate Change, and the House Committee on Personnel and Administration. Representative Deal is known for his work toward repealing the index gas fuel tax and uh, his constituent service and is also an Eagle Scout. Uh, welcome, Representative. And, Thanks, Ray. And what we'd like to do is, is ask you, if you can, talk a little bit about your legislative background, your career, uh, your view on what's happening in the State House, and uh, as you're running for uh, Senator, uh, what you can bring forth to that office. All right. Well, I understand. Uh, first of all, Ray, thank you very much for having me. Thanks for everybody coming. Uh, I know you're going to do some promotional stuff at the end. If I can just promote at the front. I'm gonna, I have a handout here about a little bit about myself in regards to small business. I also, uh, John Marion, uh, Tuxedos by Marion, is hosting something on uh, Tuesday, the 20th, uh, with Charlie Baker. There's a, an invitation here. If you, um, where's Michael? Michael's got the copies of these at the end if you want to get that. And also, um, Governor Baker will be at uh, Quans. I have about 10 of these uh, complimentary passes to come to that on Tuesday night if you want to meet with the governor. So I uh, just wanted to get that business out of the way. Yes, so Ray. Um, what is my background in uh, government? Well, it's been five years of serving as a state representative, and before that, I was on the finance committee in my uh, hometown of Whitman, right next door. Uh, I actually used to um, work over at Sign Design in, on uh, West Chestnut, and uh, you know, so got a chance to know a lot of uh, businesses from that background as well. And um, 
Also, the last project I worked on at, at Sign Design was the Campanelli Stadium project, great, um, great project for the city. Uh, then I went to work for a company called Poi and Signs down in New Bedford and um, did still a lot of work in the area, in the city with uh, banks. Sovereign Bank was taking over a lot of branches at the time. And I was on, I jo decided to join my finance committee. Um, I have two daughters. Uh, they are now uh, 14. She just turned 14 on Monday and, um, and nine years old. And my wife and I own a small business, uh, a performing arts school down in, in Hanson. Uh, she was a Broadway performer when I met her on a blind date. And um, we uh, got engaged about four months later, married a year after that. Uh, so in, in 97, I was working at Sign Design. And um, we moved to the town of Whitman, where my in-laws are, because they help with the kids. And so I always thought, uh, you mentioned an Eagle Scout. Um, I always thought I'd have a boy, I'd join a scout troop, uh, I'd have a chance to kind of go camping and give back and, you know, that sort of thing. And what ended up happening was two daughters that love ballet later. Um, my calling has been, uh, you know, more supporting them uh, in the, as, you know, at the studio and, and all that work. And uh, so I really, I wanted to have a chance to give back. Um, one of the things in scouting is leave a campground better than you found it. Um, do a good turn daily. And so I, I joined the finance committee in my town. I was doing fairly well and I thought I could lend some of my expertise uh, at the town level. And uh, it was a couple years in that I noticed that the state was cutting local aid funds, um, Chapter 70 funds, special ed circuit breaker. I became the liaison to the Whitman Hanson School Board. And, you know, that and the votes that the representative that we had at the time were taking as far as raising taxes but then not voting to have it come back with the local aid. Uh, prompted me to um, ask the question, is anybody running against this person? And this was 2008, and nobody was. So I said, well, could I run against them? And they said, sure. Uh, you just have to join your local town committee, Republican town committee, and, uh, and run. I said, well, okay. I read two books on how to run for office, and I spent 2009 and 2010 campaigning, and I ended up you know, winning, winning that race. Uh, and since I've been in office, you know, I think I've been working to what I, I consider is try to keep you know, always vote and get the money back to the town level, keep it in your wallets, and then look for places you know, where I think that they're uh, you know, making decisions that don't necessarily work best uh, for our dollars that are, are currently up there. Um, so that's been, uh, that's been the last five years. Um, you also mentioned the gas tax indexing. You know, there was that ballot question one last year that uh, talked about, there was, a, there was a transportation bill that passed which had the tech tax built in. Anybody not familiar with the tech tax, I'm happy to Really, that, that was repealed six weeks after it was instituted as part of it. 11% of our economy is, is the uh, technology sector, and we applied the six and a quarter percent sales tax to technology services, which hadn't been done before. That, that sector rose up pretty effectively and um, uh, was able to get that repealed. But a couple things that were still left in there was the uh, dollar on cigarettes uh, additionally, and then also gas tax going up three cents. But what we had a problem with, a, a group that I started working together with to uh, do this ballot question was that it would be the only tax that would index and go up automatically every year without a vote. And it's a regressive tax in that it affects, affects you know, middle to low income families the most as far as it increases the cost of their fuel, it increases the cost of goods are purchased, and it also increased yeah, municipal costs that, which would get passed on through your property taxes because there is no exemption for school buses, police cars, fire trucks. Uh, ambulances in your towns for the gas tax and so that gets caught that cost is passed on as well so worked on the ballot question and uh, spent about a good 14 months on that and we ultimately prevailed on uh, this last November and uh, able to save taxpayers you know what we think is about two billion dollars so you know it, the other thing about that was the accountability factor there is no other tax that goes up automatically without a vote. And what you would be doing in basically is giving DOT a blank check every year automatically with no strings tied to it as to how they spend it. You know, we had proven that um, DOT already had some questionable areas about how they were spending our money to begin with. 49% of the gas tax goes to the T, um, to mass transit and the T. We found out this year after the blizzard that the T um, had $2.2 billion available. They didn't even have the management to spend correctly. Uh, so that we just, you know, certainly made the point that the dollars were already there. It's just a matter of accountability and how they were spending it. So made that argument and then thought I was kind of done, but then the Olympics came along, um, I think the day after the governor was inaugurated, and we come to find out that uh, the organizers of the Olympics were talking about uh, the fact that, you know, they were telling the IOC and the USOC that taxpayers would pay for the overruns, and they were telling us, the taxpayers, this is version 1.0 of the bid, uh, that we wouldn't have to pay anything for the Olympics. Come to find out 
you know, over a period of months uh, that that was not the case and that we were probably going to be in the hook for uh, several billion dollars because we've looked at the history. No Olympics is done without an overrun since 1960. <coughs> the average overrun is 180 percent or 179 percent and the cost projected was $14.5 billion. So you do the math and you see that we would be on the hook potentially for quite a bit of money uh, up at the State House. So uh, worked on that issue and um, worked bipartisanly with um, the gentleman who ran for governor as an independent, Evan Falchuk. He actually drafted the language. I filed it in the House. Uh, it was not passed in the House. Uh, it was not passed in the Senate as filed by Senator Bob Hedlund and ultimately had to go to a ballot question. A week after we filed the ballot question language, they decided to uh, pressure the governor and the mayor of Boston to see if they would uh, do the taxpayer funding of the Olympic overruns. They said no as well. So another big win, I think, for taxpayers. And that's really my goal in the Senate is to be a uh, watchdog for your tax dollars and uh, make sure they go in the right places. So that's, that's sort of a little bit about me. Um, as far as what's going on in the, the legislature now, I think uh, if you've been paying attention that there's a supplemental budget that's going to be, um, you know, put forth very soon. Uh, there's also discussion that we're, our current budget is potentially slightly uh, out of whack by a, a little over $100 million, I believe. So uh, I think there's just going to be some debate over the supplemental budget coming out. There's also uh, a bill, I think, making its way out very quickly with uh, Governor Baker on the opiate crisis. Uh, we should be working on that soon. And, uh, and then um, I think, you know, we'll see. It's been a fairly slow session so far. Uh, I think we'll be getting into the, the next budget pretty soon as well. So you know, those are some of the updates I think I can give you now. Um, and is, is, does that answer the questions? Or? That answers the questions. Uh, if you're ready, we have some questions. Yeah. Um, just, you know, actually, if I can just add one more Absolutely. thing to it. So um, one of the things I, I think I wanted to relate to you all was um, some of the ideas that I've also tried to bring to the table since being in office and what I, you know, like to do for the future. One of the things that I, I filed in the uh, budget three years ago was a tax amnesty plan. This was for the uh, FY14 budget. Um, other states had done it. We hadn't done it yet. I was looking for new revenue without having to raise taxes. And we found that, you know, the state had $3 billion in unpaid uh, taxes by individuals and corporations. Um, new Jersey, Pennsylvania, Louisiana had done what's called a tax amnesty. It allows you to pay your taxes owed to the state as an individual or corporation without a penalty, but it's a one time only, sort of like a get out of jail free card. Um, I filed that language. It ended up passing for the individual uh, tax amnesty portion and this year the governor, uh, new Governor Baker um, expanded it to the corporate uh, end of it and we've seen tens of millions come in as a result. Uh, <coughs> it gets people basically off uh, having you know, liens against them personally. It gets businesses to have liens off them and they can grow so it's sort of a win-win for everybody. They get to clean the books, the state gets more revenue in and it's a one-time deal. It's not you can keep abusing it, that's, that's not the plan, right? Another thing that um, I proposed in the past, I'd like to continue to try to see if we can get done as incubators for entrepreneurs. I know the chamber here actually does a really nice job of using the building as an incubator for small businesses, um, from videography companies to, you know, other types of businesses. Uh, you've been able to grow some, you know, individuals who have ideas and let them take off. Uh, one of the things uh, Dr. Wall actually from Massasoit and I had talked about a while ago was that old cinema behind Christos, potentially using that as a space to allow young entrepreneurs. Um, if anybody knows Baywib next door um, and uh, Sheila over there, she's always has these entrepreneurial contests for high school kids. And we thought what a neat idea of potentially getting some of these kids with ideas that would be ready to go. Um, there was a kid who had invented a backpack with a solar panel sewed on so you could charge your phone with it. It's kind of a neat idea. Well, if he just needed some space to store material and maybe have people come in and work on it, uh, that might be a neat idea to grow a business. And so we were looking at a plan to potentially have state-owned properties uh, partner with BayWeb and, uh, and also, you know, get these entrepreneurs from, uh, from high schools and maybe college uh, to start up in, uh, in those spaces. So that's something I still think we, we could do and that would be a good idea. Um, mortgage relief program. This is one of actually the first bills I filed when I got into office was the, the mortgage crisis was really out of control in uh, 2000, really from 2009 to 2011 was the height. And uh, Pennsylvania, I looked at another state for a model. They have what is almost like um, unemployment insurance for your mortgage. It's a state-backed program by which while you're out of work uh, and you can't make a mortgage payment or you can't make the full payment, the state partners and helps you uh, make, make the payments. Now, the collateral is the state will ultimately collect on the sale of the house at some point and they, don't, you know, they won't lend beyond the value of the home. Uh, but it's an interesting idea in Pennsylvania. I thought we might be able to try it in Massachusetts. It's sort of a 
break glass in case of emergency situation. You don't want to have it out there all the time. But it's been in place in Pennsylvania since 83. I think it's an idea for us here, especially, you know, this region was hit pretty hard with the foreclosures, the city of Brockton as well. We, we have to find all sorts of remedies, I think, and that was a, a creative one to keep people in their homes. Look, the state ends up it costing them close to $3,000 a month for people that have to go into hotels. Uh, why not keep them in their home, help them out with that, and then again, you, ha you have the ability to recoup at the end. So uh, that was another plan I still have filed. Um, and I, I think, you know, that as far as business, uh, I think that pretty much kind of caps what I've been working on. So happy to take questions. Okay. And, and in fairness to uh, the candidate who was before us just recently, uh, some of the questions have already been pre-drafted. And we're going to ask you the same questions, in fact, in the same order which we asked the last candidate. So, and maybe some of, of what you discussed uh, might be a little bit redundant. So, but what issues will you make as a priority if you're elected as senator uh, for the city of Brockton in the Metro South region, which you will rep represent? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things is um, clearly uh, the opiate crisis is, is is facing Brockton. I mean, we need to get these dealers off the street. There was currently a bill um, that passed in the House on fentanyl uh, <coughs> and uh, sentencing. Um, actually an amendment to try to make a mandatory minimum on, uh, on dealers and uh, that, that did not pass as an amendment. So I think continuing to try to crack down, get those dealers off the streets is a part of what would help Brockton as well. Um, the other thing too clearly you've got as issues is, well, I wouldn't say issues, is opportunities, is um, the old location where uh, Christos is, was, uh, I think that that really, the Allied Services uh, building that the tr Dr. Wall uh, at Massasoit wanted to go through with, that should really be picked up. Uh, I, w I did not agree with the b governor on, on taking that out of the budget. Also the downtown development for the Bridgewater State Campus, uh, I think that's another thing that we really have to discuss with the governor and uh, I, I plan on talking to him extensively about that issue. So those are the downtown things. And then, you know, generally speaking, I think it's, it's economy and jobs. I think there's Currently, uh, you know, taxes already leave a pretty heavy burden. I know Bro uh, Broughton had to increase taxes. Um, I think we have to find, you know, ways up at the state has to tighten the belt before we ask everybody else who's already being, you know, hit with taxes in, at all levels to, uh, to constantly carry the freight. So um, those would be, you know, some of the work right off the bat. Okay. Here within the city of Brockton and, and I'm sure in the region, the issue of charter schools uh, can be an emotional issue and a challenging issue and there are pros and cons and uh, supporters and those who oppose it on both sides. Uh, and we also know that the administration may have a position. Uh, what would be your position on charter schools and what are, what are some of your thoughts? So working with uh, the Whitman Hanson Regional uh, School Board when I was, um, when I was the liaison, you know, I originally felt charter schools depleted, you know, transportation funds. Um, they, you know, took away some of the, when the money follows, follows the child, they take away resources from each school district. Uh, you know, that's a problem, I think, generally. Uh, but specifically, you know, I think the charter schools and the way that the governor's currently proposed it is, is to help areas where, you know, you're under 25% in performance. And, you know, I don't see Brockton there. And I think the other thing is that Brockton has the choice not to, um, you know, take on a charter school. So it seems like the choice is there. Uh, I, I know that what you're trying to do is create competition in education to create better practices. I think one of the things we did too that was a big mistake was adoption of Common Core. Um, the representative I ran against in 2010 was Vice Chair of Education and I asked him during a debate why we had zero hearings to adopt Common Core which ultimately brought the state $250 million uh, in race to the top funds, not even close enough to pay for what each city and town is paying for now in technology services to upgrade to four Common Core testing standards. Uh, and that's before we get into textbook curriculum, all the additional costs for that. So uh, I think that was a mistake then. I think charter schools are a potential option, uh, but I think, you know, hearing from citizens in Broughton, I don't necessarily think it's, it's something that's going to go here, uh, but I would think that the, the citizens should have a voice in it as well. If you're elected senator, you may be asked to provide a leadership role uh, with the en entire delegation within the region. Uh, how will you bring the legislative delegation together in that type of leadership role, uh, especially as it speaks to the business interests within the Metro South region? Yeah, I mean, again, as the only candidate, you know, in this race that owns a business, works, uh, employs folks, you know, I hope that the fellow delegates uh, <coughs> from this area will look to me as somebody who understands what it's like to uh, issue a paycheck, uh, knows what it's like to try to um, start a business, 
uh, deal with regulation. You know, my wife and I built a new building in the town of Hanson. A lot of work with DEP because there's underground storage tanks that we had to take care of. You know, we, I've worked for uh, <laughs> quite a number of years with uh, small businesses in, in the city, uh, in the region, and again, I think you know I'm open to suggestions from people in in the House, obviously people in the Senate, and most importantly the the business community and the citizens of uh, of this district. I mean, there where you get really great ideas about how we need to do a better job. I've been canvassing this Senate district uh, extensively for the last two months, and uh, I know there's about three weeks left to go. Uh, I don't have all the greatest ideas, you know. I have. I just want to work with people who have great ideas and put those people and ideas together and make it happen. I hope the delegate uh, delegation of representatives and uh, other senators in the region uh, will be on board with that as well. Now, if elected senator, and this is a good follow-up to that, if elected senator, what role can you play to bring business and investment to the Metro South region? Yeah, I mean, well, that's that's where we get back to the economy and uh, what we d can do to make Massachusetts a better state for business. I mean, we are, what, Frank, 47th in the country as far as places to, to do business. Um, we have, uh, you know, we, we create taxes that don't necessarily help companies want to stay here. They kind of cause uh, people to want to potentially move. Um, you know, so I think we need to do a better job with our tax environment. The gas tax, I think, was a great start as far as saving businesses and individuals money. Um, you know, utilities, uh, you know, increasing taxes on utilities is a mistake. Uh, and and we're, we now are faced with um, the fact that we've lost two coal-fired plants in the last uh, few years. We're about to lose Pilgrim Nuclear in the next few years. Uh, you know, utility cost for in business is extraordinary. Uh, I know Governor Baker's filing a utility bill that's going to try to get uh, additional hydroelectric. We're looking at uh, wind and solar as well, um, but also the gas pipeline coming into Massachusetts, the natural gas pipeline. Uh, they're looking to expand those pipe or create a larger pipeline physically uh, because we don't have the capacity now. I was speaking to a business owner that says, based on power demands, you know, his cost go up every year automatically, and then uh, if he needs additional power in the winter, he's got to um, you know, pay additional money for the pipeline space that you have in each pipeline. So larger pipelines bringing in more energy is a big thing. We've got to do a better job of that as well. Uh, that will lead, you know, hopefully companies in here grow the, um, the tax base for corporations and then at the same time grow jobs that ultimately uh, allow for more revenue from that growth of tax base. So instead of driving companies out and then causing taxes to have to go up on the few remaining companies and individuals here, let's go the other way. Uh, give businesses a better opportunity to grow here in New England and uh, in Massachusetts specifically. And that should, that should take us in a different direction as far as tax, tax burdens. Now you've lived in the region, you work in the region, you have worked in the region, you represent the region. What do you see some of the biggest opportunities and frankly some of the challenges uh, for development here in the city of Brockton and within the region? Well, you know, again, I, it, I don't want to say it's too redundant, but I think that, um, again, the creating an environment by businesses, um, being able to grow the uh, energy costs, things like that. Um, I get back to I'll get back to spending up on Beacon Hill and where you know we can do a better job of, of making sure we aren't wasting money so that uh, we have it more more of it stays in the household more of it stays at the at the town level. Um, we decided to switch over to the Affordable Care Act uh, from a fully functioning health care connector a couple of years ago. It was a disaster. I mean, if most everybody probably realizes this. Uh, you know, the, the website pretty much didn't work for the better part of a year. Uh, we had to cover health, uh, health insurance plans for people who were able to pay, uh, but because they couldn't sign up online, we had to pay for that. So that was uh, over a billion dollars that was wasted. Uh, that, that cost gets transferred directly to the companies that we want to attract here. It gets you know, put right to the, uh, the individual who has to pay their portion of their uh, health care coverage from the company they're working for. Uh, that was a terrible decision. Why do we make that decision, right? So. Um, you know, I, I think making better decisions for the future is, is also a part of how we can draw more people here. Now, the city of Brockton has quite a bit of affordable housing. Uh, and what is your position and your views on affordable housing here in the city of Brockton and throughout the region that you'll be asked to represent? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, affordable housing, obviously, you have to, <coughs> there's, a, there's a retiring population you want to make sure you have the capacity to handle, and especially as we move into the baby boomer you know, period where we're going to have more demand on that as well. Um, one of the other things that I, I filed personally was a, um, and this just kind of goes to, you know, kind of making sure there's the availability there. I filed a, um, an amendment to a budget that would require, uh, you know, matching federal requirements for housing 
uh, state requirements to match federal housing, which included your social security number. You know, like it or not, we are getting a large immigrant population that's not here and not uh, naturalized that is taking a portion of that, of those resources. And I think what we need to do is match federal standards and make that uh, available to people who are in the process of, of becoming a citizen or are citizens so that we don't have people who have been in the system, uh, paying into the system in the state for years, and then now don't have that affordable housing available to them. So that's one step towards uh, creating additional capacity. Now you mentioned it earlier in your opening uh, remarks and your conversation with us about the Downtown College Collaborative. Uh, as Senator, uh, what message would you take back to Governor Breaker about the importance of that? And I also want to table set this a little bit as we did with the prior candidate. This was work that was done over years, years of time uh, with the prior uh, Patrick administration. I know that you were at the event of the announcement uh, as well as the other candidate. And uh, a lot of work has been done on, the, on behalf or on the part of uh, Massasoit Community College, Bridgewater State University, and uh, UMass Boston. What message can you bring to the governor? And what will you say to the governor on the importance of this? I'd love to say what were you thinking, but I, I'll try to be more, be more polite than that. Um, no, you know, again, I've talked to Fred Clark a couple years ago about this potential uh, project, so this has been in the works for a long time. Um, I know Dr. Wall has talked to me about several things with Massasoit, that being one of the, I think in 2011 when I first got in, you, you know, you'd been working on this plan. So, so um, yes, this is something that I'm going to advocate strongly for. Look, I think what, what Governor Baker was talking about was you want to have a nice mix of um, private private uh, corporations in downtown and not have it be all too, you know, state or federal government heavy. I get what he's trying to say, but if he's able to take a look at Trinity Corporation and uh, what they've done, uh, you know, as a private investment, uh, private and public partnerships, I think that the uh, downtown campuses are, uh, downtown campuses would be great. I think the Massasoit fleshing out what they need there for allied services would be great as well. <coughs> and, uh, you know, again, Governor Baker will be getting hearing it pretty much uh, from day one, if I'm fortunate to get in, that these are the priorities uh, are laying out for downtown Brockton or, or Brockton in general. Okay. Well, on behalf of uh, this committee, the Government Affairs Committee, uh, and the entire chamber, well, we would like to thank you for your uh, participation in our events and your support of the chamber, and would like to thank you for your public service. And no matter what happens in November, we want to wish you the very best. Great. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. And uh, I, if I can just add to one thing, um, you know, you've had government, uh, Chris, you've held government forums here for legislators to come in on pretty much monthly for years. Yeah. I've been able to take an opportunity to do it several times. And I just want to thank you for this interactive forum, not just today, but always. You're always there to kind of be the conduit so that legislators can speak to your membership and other people uh, from the city about what we're working on, what we can do. And I think the chamber is probably one of the most valuable assets we have in the city as well, because you are that glue that holds everybody together. Thank so you thank you for that. And on, and on behalf of the chamber, this will match the pen that you just took out of your pocket. <laughs> that's right. So, so uh, we must have a lot of pens. <laughs> My so, wife can use a good pen. So that's so. good. <laughs> well, I want to thank uh, Representative Deal and Representative Brady for being here today to have a uh, honest and frank conversation with us on what they see happening in the legislature, their backgrounds, and answering, uh, I feel, very directly as best they can the questions that were proposed here by members of the Government Affairs Committee. Now, on a promotion for the Government Affairs Committee and the Chamber, we have a number of events that are uh, coming up. On this coming Tuesday, October 20th, we will have the Mayor of the uh, City of Brockton, Bill Carpenter, presenting a uh, plan for the future called the Transformative Development Initiative. We will also have Transportation Secretary uh, Stephanie Pollack there as well, talking about some of the transportation issues facing this, uh, this region and the Commonwealth, as well as a briefing on Cuba. Uh, we will also have, on October 21st, the next day, a business after hours at Wood Palace in Middleborough. And on November 18th is our annual meeting, which is always a, a great event. We expect about 450 to 500 people, uh, where uh, our keynote speaker will be Jan Singer. Uh, she grew up in Brockton, and she's the CEO of Spanx Industries and a multi-billion dollar company. And uh, I'm sure that's going to be a great event. What we do suggest is that you try to buy your tickets early. Uh, the chamber really doesn't want to refuse anyone from this great event. And uh, Chris uh, and the staff do such a 
a fantastic job of that, and it's always a sellout, and it's also our business uh, expo event. And then on uh, December 17th, we will have Governor Charlie Baker at a, uh, a breakfast event, and that uh, I want to thank Chris and the staff for securing the governor. He is sought uh, uh, after all over the Commonwealth, and we're very thankful and appreciative for the staff for, for doing that. And that will be hosted by Dr. Wall at Massasoit Community College. And I can only imagine what questions Dr. Wall will be asking uh, <laughs> uh, the good governor. Early and often. Early and often. <laughs> so on behalf of the chamber, we would again like to thank our sponsor, UMass uh, Boston, for our government affairs uh, events throughout the year uh, and, our, and our lunches, and also Brockton Community Access and Mark Lindy and his staff for covering this as well as many other events. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for participating here and coming to our events. And uh, please have a safe day and a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.